Good morning. Good morning, church. How are we? Good. Hey, my name is Alex, and I'm one of the, uh, the pastors here at Fellowship, and we're just so excited that you have joined us uh, for worship today. Uh, today is the first Sunday in Advent, and uh, uh, we, over the next few weeks as we celebrate Advent, uh, are going to hear from uh, some of our elders uh, in our church who are going to handle uh, the lighting of the Advent candle and the reading of our Advent passage and devotional. And so today I want to invite the Warren and Mundy family to join me up here uh, on the platform as they lead us in week one of our Advent candle lighting and reading. You got the lighting duties I see there. That's awesome. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the hope candle, also known as the prophecy candle. This candle represents the anticipation and hope of the Messiah's coming. The color purple symbolizes royalty and repentance as we prepare our hearts. Isaiah 9, 2, and 6 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's pray. Lord, we light this purple candle of hope. We remember that your light pierces the darkness, and brings hope to all who trust in you. Fill our hearts with anticipation for your coming, and may we carry this hope into every corner of our lives. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, as we continue worship, before we dive in, there was an important game yesterday. And let's just say the good guys won. Listen, I'll leave it at that. Let me start with a question uh, this morning. Have you, um, surely you've heard this phrase before, or have you heard this phrase before, uh, the GOAT? Have you heard anyone use that term, the GOAT, right? It's an acronym, and it stands for what? Greatest of all time. That's right. Greatest of all time. And so we like to use this term, uh, the goat, and, and, and we like to use, we pick a specific genre like music or something like that. And, and, and so we say, hey, this person or this thing, th this, is the, this, this is the greatest of all time. Like, for example, it's like, um, who, who's the goat superhero and why is it Batman? Yeah, right? I mean, it's definitely Batman. There are no, he is the greatest of all time, right? Superheroes. Uh, or we'll say something like when it comes to football, like Tom Brady is the GOAT. He was the greatest NFL quarterback of all time. Uh, or if we talk basketball, often it's Michael Jordan uh, that gets brought up in the conversation. Uh, but, you know, whatever it is, it's, uh, we do this with musicians and uh, athletes and movies, you know, just all kinds of different genres, all kinds of different things. And here's the thing, when you get into these conversations about who the goat is or who is the goat of, of whatever uh, it is, a lot of it is super subjective, isn't it? Um, it has a lot to do with maybe our cultural background and where we grew up or our temperament and personalities and that sort of thing. Uh, we all have these different opinions, and that's what um, makes trying to decide who's the greatest of all time a lot of fun. We've got all this different criteria and different things that, that we use to, to judge and different opinions. Uh, today, as we begin this season of Advent, we're starting a new series titled, He Shall Be 
called. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring some of the different names that Jesus was called or referred to in the Christmas narrative. Um, Over the next few weeks, we're going to explore uh, names like Emmanuel, uh, Messiah, Savior. Uh, I hope to do one in a few weeks called Nazarene, when Jesus was called a Nazarene. But today, we're starting with this name that Jesus was called, this title, Son of the Most High. Son of the Most High. Um, And so what I want to do today is I want to roll back the clock approximately 4,000 years. 4,000 years ago, scattered across what we today would call the Middle East um, or Northern Africa and Asia, there were countless kings and kingdoms. Uh, There were uh, countless religions. There were gods. There were goddesses. There were mythologies. There was a great diversity of belief in lots of ways, just like the world today. But in that world, there was a rather unremarkable 75-year-old guy. And this guy was just going about his business. He was just a normal dude uh, until one day um, he hears the voice of a God. And for no conceivable reason, this God tells him, hey, I have just selected you Uh, You you didn't know that there was a competition, but you won. Uh, I just selected you to be the father of a great nation, to be the founder of this great nation. And this God says to him that he's going to bless him. He's going to bless this nation. He's going to protect this nation. And eventually, that the whole entire world is going to be blessed through the lineage, through the downline, through the family tree of this 75-year-old really unremarkable guy, at least unremarkable at the time. Hopefully you remember this story from our Genesis study last year. This guy's name was what? Abram or Abraham. And so if you remember the story, you know that he takes his wife, Sarai, who eventually becomes Sarah, and his nephew, Lot, and they head out where God tells them to go to a place called the Negev. And when they get there, uh, they start to settle there, but there's a famine in the land. Uh, And so Abram or Abraham uh, takes off and he heads south down to Egypt for a while. He's kind of running from where God's told him to go. And eventually he returns back up to uh, the Negev. And, uh, and, and so, trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, eventually, he ends up back in, in the Negev, and he's acquired so much wealth at this point that he and his nephew Lot uh, have to separate. And, and so, they divide up, and one guy goes to one part of the land, and, and his nephew Lot takes off to another part uh, of the land. And then what happens is Lot ends up in this area where there's these four kings Uh, who are battling uh, these other kings, and Lot gets caught in the middle of all of this. So much so that Lot's taken captive uh, at some point in this skirmish uh, with with these kings. And um, Abram hears about this, and he decides to take action. He's like, "Uh, this is family. Uh, I've got to go rescue them. And so Abram forms a militia, the scripture tells us, the Bible tells us, of 318 Men. He forms this little army. Uh, they set out uh, to go defeat these kings to get Lot back, and they do that. Uh, he, he heads out at 75 years of age with an army, and, and they go and attack these kings who've already won a victory over some other kings, and he gets his nephew Lot and his family back. That's a bunch of info. But that's the setup for Genesis 14, and again, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. And so if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me first to Genesis 14, and then you can put a finger at Luke chapter 1, because we'll eventually get to Luke chapter 1. But this is Genesis 14. We're going to pick it up right after uh, Abram has rescued his nephew Lot. Uh, I'll begin in verse 17. Here's what it says. It says, after Abram returned from defeating Keterlamer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the Shava Valley, that is, the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, 
creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who's handed over your enemies to you. Okay, just going to pause right there. Okay, so, so um, this is why I started here. This is the first time in the Bible, in the scriptures, that we hear this phrase, God most high. And it appears no less than three times right here in this text. And the Hebrew word for, or, or phrase for God most high is El Elyon. El Elyon, that's the Hebrew, and it means God most high. In fact, literally what it means, because there were all these other gods in the culture at the time, El Elyon was a title that was reserved for the God that sits above all the other gods. Sometimes they would use that title for a king, and so if they were to call a king El Elyon, that means that that was the king that was higher than all the other kings. This is significant because, again, in this world where these countless kings and kingdoms, here we have the priest who is the priest of the God who sits above all the other gods. He's El Elyon. He's the God most high. And this guy, Melchizedek, his priest, is telling Abram that this God who randomly called you and told you and sent you to the Negev, he is that God. He is the God most high. He is the God that sits at the top of the food chain. And from this point on, this phrase, God most high, or El Elyon, keeps getting repeated um, throughout the Old Testament. In fact, King David writes a song uh, when God has rescued him from his enemies, and that song's found in 2 Samuel chapter 22. Let me just read part of that song. David's singing the song, and by the way, it doesn't rhyme, so don't try to make it. But here's what he says. He says, I called to the Lord in my distress. I called to my God. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry for help reached his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the heavens trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. Smoke rose from his nostrils and consuming fire came from his mouth. Coals were set ablaze by it. He bent the heavens and came down. Total darkness beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, soaring on the wings of the wind. He made darkness a canopy around him, a gathering of water and thick clouds. From the radiance of his presence, blazing coals were ignited. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High made his voice heard. David says, that is my God, El Elyon. In many of the Psalms, which are written by David, he continues to use this imagery. A prophet named Daniel would refer to El Elyon, the God most high, and a bunch of terrifying prophecies in the book of Daniel to show just how powerful God is. This language, we see El Elyon, God most high, throughout the Old Testament until God goes silent. God goes silent, and for 400 years, we hear nothing about El Elyon. We hear nothing about the God most high. And you're like, Pastor Alex, what does this have to do with Christmas and Jesus and the Advent season? Well, Advent means waiting. And suddenly, out of this 400-year silence, an angel appears to a woman named Elizabeth. And then a few months later, the same angel appears to a teenage girl named Mary. And this is what happens in Luke chapter 1. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Okay, let's just pause right there. Now, there's only two angels that have names in the Bible. 
Do, do you know what those names are? <laughs> I'm sure you said it right. That's just what it sounded like up here. Uh, there's two angels. One's Michael, and the other is Gabriel. Uh, Michael tends to be the archangel, like the, the angel of war and, and victory and stuff like that. Uh, and then there's Gabriel, and Gabriel is the guy that makes announcements on behalf of God. And so when God has something really important to say, he typically sends uh, the angel Gabriel to make this announcement, to share his um, word. And what do we knew, know about angels? We talked a little bit about this uh, during the Genesis series. Um, the angels, they're kind of like uh, the army rangers, right? They're, they're like the, the marines. They're like God's uh, marines that he sends. And typically when they show up, people are terrified. Just about any time an angel shows up in the Bible, people are, are terrified, they panic, they freak out. But what's interesting about Mary here is she doesn't seem to panic or freak out just at the uh, presence of the angel. Mary's a little bit different. She freaks out, not at the angel, but by the words of his message when the angel says, or where it says here in the scripture, she was deeply troubled by this statement. I mean, think about it. Um, this angel appears and says, God's put some special favor on you, right? That this angel, the announcing angel Gabriel says, hey, I have this message for you. And she's got to be wondering what this could uh, possibly be. And so here's what it says in verse 30. Then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Okay, um, there's a lot in this. I mean, first of all, the angel Gabriel shows up, and this is God speaking to an angel, and he uses her name. I, I don't want you to miss that because it's very tender, right? I mean, he calls her by name. He, he's letting her know that God has a plan for her life. And then through this announcement, he drops this bomb that she's going to have a son and that God has already picked out a name for him. He, God's already picked out our son's name. And we're going to talk about the significance of Jesus' name next week, so we're going to skip over that for now. Just know, when you come back next week, that his name's packed with significance. But look at what the angel told her. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. So, so that word, um, great, in the original language, it just means uh, magnificent, it means powerful, it, uh, um, it, it means noble, it's, it's splendid. How great is he? Like, is he Batman great? <laughs> is he Tom Brady great? Well, there's no denying how great his name would be because this is what it says. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. This, Jesus, is the son of El El Yom. This is the son of the God that sits high above all the other gods and goddesses and kings and kingdoms and mythologies. This God, th this child Jesus that she will give birth to is the son of the Most High. Which caused me to think, as I was studying this this week, wait a minute, um, who calls Jesus the Son of the Most High? And so uh, I went on a little research rabbit trail uh, this week, and do you know who calls Jesus the Son of the Most High in the gospel accounts? It's, uh, it, it's, it's crazy. In fact, I want to read this whole section to you. It's from Mark chapter 5. I know this is a long passage, but you just have to hear this thing. Here's what it says, Mark chapter 5. They came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Gerasenes. As soon as he got out of the boat, and this is talking about Jesus, as soon as Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met him. 
He lived in the tombs, and no one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains, but had torn the chains apart and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him, and he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus, talking to this man, really talking to these demons, says, what is your name? My name is Legion, he answered him, because we, the demons, we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we may enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and destroyed the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned there. The men who tended them ran off and reported it to the town and the countryside, and the people went to see what happened. They came to Jesus and saw the man who'd been demon-possessed sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs, and then they began to beg Jesus to leave the region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who'd been demon-possessed begged him earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus did not let him, but told him, Go home to your own people and report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for them. And they were all amazed. Isn't that crazy? I mean, this guy is unrestrainable. He is unstoppable. He's possessed by so many demons, they call themselves legion. And you're asking, well, how many is legion? Well, I don't really know, but here's what I do know. There were 2,000 pigs. And so just go with me there for a minute. Perhaps there's 2,000 demons. And so this guy is just full of demons. They're controlling him, uh, tormenting him, suppressing his will, burying his identity and his personhood. And these demons recognize Jesus in an instant and say, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. Okay, process that for a second. Nobody can control this guy. Chains can't hold him, right? What does it say? Shackles can't hold him. And yet thousands of demons inside of this man tremble at Jesus' appearance because he is the son of El Elyon. He's the son of the Most High. And so when Jesus casts these demons into these pigs, everybody begs Jesus to leave. And I think that's fair because, listen, you either have to worship Jesus or be afraid of him. Because he has the awesome power of the Most High. And Mary, this teenage girl, is told, that's going to be your son. To which she has the most logical response. Okay, so back to the story in Luke chapter 1. Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth, even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called childless for nothing will be impossible with God. Okay, so imagine if you can, uh, what Mary must have thought. I mean, everything in her life has been just completely turned upside down. How would you respond to something that was absolutely impossible without God? Here's her response, verse 38. She says, See, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you've said. Friends, that's a remarkable response. Mary says, 
okay, I'm in. I, I, I don't even know what this is going to mean for me, uh, but I'm in. She's not like, I don't know, should I do this, should I not do this, uh, can we just let some of this play out, and then maybe I can make up my mind later. Uh, she's like, no, I'm completely in. I am the Lord's servant. Whatever it is that you've just said to me, even though I don't understand it, let it happen to me. No matter what happens, right, no matter what this means for my life, whatever you just said, may it, may it be. I think that's so astonishing because we're so oriented as people in this day and age in controlling our own destiny and making our own choices and having our own options that a statement like that, at least it does for me, it just rattles me. She didn't ask for this. I mean, this is going to cause her some public disgrace. People weren't going to believe her. You're pregnant? How'd you get pregnant? God? I mean, it's unbelievable sounding, isn't it? In our culture, we're just used to unwed pregnancies. And listen, that is no condemnation if that's you. But it would have been excruciatingly shameful in this culture. In fact, it wouldn't have been uncommon uh, for someone to take her life because of that, for her to be killed for being pregnant out of wedlock. The fact that she had a son before she'd consummated this relationship would be news to everyone in town. And again, the fact that she's pregnant out of wedlock is going to cause insults, probably cause the loss of her fiancé. Cruel treatment for her son, cruel treatment for her. And she says, may this happen to me exactly as you've said. It's just incredible. And so it'd be easy in reading this Christmas narrative right now at this juncture to make Mary out to be a hero. And she's pretty amazing. I I don't want to minimize that. In fact, um, there are more females, more women named Mary than any other name. It's been the most popular female name since the beginning of forever. But here's what's even more amazing to consider. Just like Abram, right, this normal random dude 4,000 years ago was kind of like just picked out of nowhere Um, There was also nothing really special about Mary. What was special was is that each one of them had an encounter with the Most High God, who forever changed the trajectory of their life. I I don't think Abraham um, probably would have picked war and famine and and moving his family hundreds of miles just because this God that he didn't really know just shows up and speaks into his life and having to go to war to rescue his nephew, I don't think he would have chosen that. Mary probably wouldn't have picked ridicule or shame. But when the most high God calls you, he changes your priority from the inside out. And if you're here today and you say, man, I don't know, I follow Jesus, but my life really hasn't changed that much, then I have a few follow-up questions because when you've encountered the Most High God or the Son of the Most High God, everything changes. Just listen to the words of Jesus, the Son of the Most High, a few chapters later in Luke 6. Here's what he says. But I say to you who listen, okay, the Son of the Most High God says this, Love your enemies. Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you, and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. 
And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing in return. And then listen to this. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of who? The Most High. For he is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. You know, the reason that we can just even dream about doing any of those things that Jesus has just called us to do, the only reason that we would want to do any of those things is because the Son of the Most High, in the words of the psalmist David, back in 2 Samuel 22, said, this Son bent down, he stooped low, down to us. The God who sits high stoops low. And when we were his enemy, he loved us. And when we mistreated him, he took it not just on the cheek, but he took the nails pierced in his hands and in his feet. And he died on a cross for us. When we were evil, this says he was merciful and gracious. And friends, when that truth pierces deep into your soul, it will change you. And it will make you more like him. And then at that point, it won't matter who is the goat. It won't matter who's the greatest of all time because it will be about Jesus, the Son of the Most High God.